Delilah, this is your ex-boyfriend Samson And I know you thought that lifting weights made me so buff and handsome You were wrong It's cause I let my hair grow long It makes me strong Hey there Delilah, you snuck in while I was sleeping And I didn't feel you cutting And I didn't hear you creeping out the door you left my hair piled on the floor Well, I just snored Oh, it's what you did to me Oh, I'm a Nazarene Oh, it's what you did to me Oh, well, I'm shaved clean Delilah, you're so mean Killed the lion, big and mean, and slaughtered many Philistines All with the donkey's jawbone, that's no lie But now I'm chained up to the wall and I can't cry no tears at all Because it came and gouged out both my eyes This is a Bible story Why'd you grab those clipping shears and shave my head like Britney Spears And now I'm standing here in total shame and you're to blame Why did you have to deceive me? Helped me to think that not long ago I wanted you to be my bride But you took too much off the sides Hey there Delilah when you die Please tell the devil I said hi Well no know why Oh it's what you did to me up a creek Oh, now I feel so weak You know, Delilah, you're a geek Now I feel so weak Oh, Delilah, you're a freak You know, in some words I can't speak Because we're in church this morning you Can't say those words in church Delilah, you crazy freaky chick If you've been joining us, and if you haven't, we've been in the book of Judges for the past few weeks. And we've been looking at the people of Israel, that after Moses led the people out of Egypt out of slavery, Moses died and Joshua took over the book of Joshua. Joshua led them into the promised land, a time where there, there was no king in Israel. And so in between this time of entering the promised land until they eventually had a king, when we saw King Saul and King David continue to reign, this is this time period. In Israel, and they were given a command. God told them, you need to get these people groups out of the promised land, or they're going to be a thorn in your side. Well, for Israel, they kind of halfway listened. And if you've got kids, maybe you understand that idea that, well, my kids kind of halfway listened and did what I told them to do, but not completely. And so the people of Israel have these other tribes around them now that eventually rule over them. And that's part of why God told them, you need to get these people out. They're evil. This is your land, and I'm using you to punish these other people groups, the Canaanites, the Philistines. But now, they're being ruled by the Canaanites and the Philistines. And so Israel struggles in this, and they continue to find themselves being ruled over, and they cry out to God because you know, things aren't how they'd like it to be. They're in trouble. God, save us. God, help us. And he does. And he sends them somebody that's referred to as a judge. Hence, the book of Judges. So God sends a judge, and they take out whoever's giving them problems, and they kind of get things right in the land, and all is good. And people of Israel are following God now until that judge dies. And Israel goes right back to the garbage they were doing that they continued to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. They continued to do what was right in their own eyes. And unfortunately this morning, I wish I could say that they finally figured it out, but they haven't. Today we're going to be in Judges chapter 13 as we look at one of these last final judges that God sends to try to redeem the people of Israel back to God. So if you've got the Bibles next to you, it's page 137. 
And we look at this story of a, of a birth of a man to come. But in the meantime, verse 1, we read this. Judges 13, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Yuck. That doesn't sound like fun at all. But as God does, He's constantly working upstream. He's constantly got a plan. And so God has picked a barren woman, somebody who hasn't been able to have kids yet. And there's an angel of the Lord that visits this woman and her husband and says, you're going to have a child. And your child is going to save your people. Sounds like an awful familiar story to me. That you're going to have this kid and your, your kid's going to grow up to redeem and save your people from the Philistines. But in the meantime, your kid is going to be set apart from birth. He's going to have a special vow placed on him and he's got some specific rules that he needs to follow beyond everything else that we've already commanded you to do. He's going to be a Nazarite. And as a Nazarite, you're not allowed to drink anything from grapes, any wine, any hard drink, especially while she's pregnant. But even as he's born, he's not allowed to have this stuff. You're not allowed to make yourself unclean. So anything that the Jewish culture would deem unclean, especially like a, a dead body, a dead carcass, would be unclean for a Nazarite. And then lastly, you're not to let a razor touch his head. Don't, don't shave the boy's head. Don't give him any haircuts. That's, in a nutshell, part of what it means to be a Nazarite. So this woman becomes pregnant, and as we skip ahead, chapter 13, verse 24, it says, And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. So Samson's becoming a dude. He's becoming a man. He's, he's reaching that, that period of life where, as a young man, you start to realize that, hey, there's another gender in life. That there's also these, these young women. And unfortunately for Samson, and, and maybe unfortunately for, for some of us guys, that these, this woman, these, these women issues, become an issue. And ultimately, it's going to cripple Samson and his love for the opposite sex. And so Samson's wanting to get married, and he sees a girl that tickles his fancy, but unfortunately, she's from the wrong people group. That she's, in fact, a woman from the Philistines. At the beginning of chapter 14, we read, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all the people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Now I, I don't know what it is about people in the Old Testament marrying their cousins. But the point being is that there's, there's not another suitable girl in his eyes that seems to be what he wants. Because he ends with this statement at the end of verse 3. He says, But Samson said to his father, Go get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And we continue to see this trend pop up in God's people. Well, she might not be what you would approve of, mom and dad, but she's who I want. That's enough marital drama to handle. Being married into a family where mom and dad or mother and father-in-law don't approve of you because you're not from the right bloodline. But again, God is working upstream. And his parents didn't understand that God was using this as an opportunity Verse 4 reads, His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So again, the Israelites, they're not in control. The Philistines have them on their thumb. And Samson sees one of these Philistine daughters and wants to marry her. We don't even know her name. He just knows that he's, he's found someone that's right in his own eyes. So they go down to this place, they go down to get this girl, and, 
and try to unite them in marriage. And on the way, they're walking through the vineyards of this area of Timnah. And all of a sudden, this lion pops out roaring at Samson and his family. So what does Samson do? He hightails it out of there, right? Because you've got a lion chasing you. You know that's not what he does. Verse 6 reads this. I want you to catch this. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Now, it's interesting. It talks about tearing a young goat. Has anyone just torn a young goat with their bare hands lately? I, I haven't, let alone a lion. This is one feat of strength out of many that we're about to see from Samson throughout the course of his life. That Samson's got this brute, crazy strength, this Hulk-like strength to just rip this line apart. So he kills this thing and goes down and gets his wife. Well, that's cool and all, but what happens next is, is a problem for Samson. Because as he's about to make a marital vow with his, his new wife, he's about to break a vow. Verse 8 says, After some days he returned to take her, to come back and take his wife. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. So what did he do? He, he scraped it out with his hands and went on eating as he went. I don't know how the honey got there. <laughs> Normally, you know, it's been a few days, roadkill. Again, and depending on maybe what part of the country you're from, if you're into eating roadkill or not, that's on you. But he, he comes back to this lion days later. You know, it's probably starting to decay, probably smells funny, but all of a sudden there's honey in this thing. Well, that sounds good. I'm kind of hungry. Sure, let's stop for a little bite. And somehow... He collected enough or just had his hands just dripping full of honey that he went back to his mother and father and gave them something to eat too. Well, that's, that's awful nice of you, Samson, to give us some honey. Where, where did you get it? It doesn't matter. It's good. Just eat it. Out of the body of a dead lion, he found honey. Here's the issue. What was Samson's vow? He was a Nazarite. He wasn't to make himself unclean with anything. This was certainly a dead body, which would have been unclean. The honey, not as much of an issue. If he'd have got the honey from the local grocery store, tavern, the whatever, an actual honey farmer versus the body of a dead lion, he'd have been in good shape. But in that moment of convenience, when he walks by and notices this something sweet that tempts him, he makes himself unclean. He breaks his Nazarite vow for something convenient, for something sweet, something that was tempting, that he thought he needed at that moment. How often do we do that in our relationship with God? We might not necessarily be a Nazarite. You know, we cut our hair and sometimes we actually trim our beards too. But in that moment where, hey, this is available. This looks good. This is pleasing to the eye and what's right in my own eyes. Let's take a, advantage of this opportunity. And we turn our back on God for a little bit of honey. What's your honey this morning? And that moment of convenience to turn aside and to see that piece of temptation in front of you. What do we do with that honey? So in the meantime, Samson's breaking a vow while he's trying to make a vow with his spouse. And trying to respect and honor that vow. So Samson, they're getting ready to get married and they're ready to have their wedding reception. Now, we, we have these receptions in our culture too, and you know, it's, it's a fun night. There's usually food, some kind of meal, and then decorations, lights, music, it's a good time, maybe a few drinks. This particular wedding reception was a huge week-long feast. Where you're, for seven days, you're sitting down, you're eating, probably drinking some stuff too. Now again, Samson, we're not, he's not supposed to have any wine. He's not supposed to have any, any grapes or strong drink. And it talked about that they went down to these vineyards of Timnah. Well, vineyards produce grapes, right? What do you do with grapes? Well, you make wine. And, and communion. We celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection. We remember him crucified through a little bit of grape juice. Jesus used the, the same symbols as he had the Last Supper with his apostles. 
So it's a part of their culture back in that time. They made wine. Now, it's, it has to be assumed. It's not in the text. But do you suppose that at some point during this week-long party, strike two, Samson, you're not supposed to have wine. That maybe he had himself a couple drinks or maybe a couple boxes of wine. He's probably a big guy. Maybe it took him a little bit to really feel it. And in that moment, he, he sees these wedding guests come in. He's breaking vows. He's making vows. These wedding guests come in and there's 30 of them, other Philistines. And he, he's maybe you know, a, a little bit of a, a lush. He's feeling good. He's high on spirits or just in a good mood. And thinks, you know, let's, let's make a bit of a gamble tonight. These guests come in and he says, I, I'll, I'll wager you something. I've got a riddle for you that if you can solve my riddle, I will give you 30 pairs of clothes. And if, if you get my riddle, I'll give you those 30 pairs of clothes. But if you don't, and I win, you give me 30 pairs of clothes. Now that's a weird thing to gamble over, but that's what they had in that time. And so, game on, the bet's made, and Samson proposes this riddle to him. Verse 14, he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days... They could not solve the riddle. Now for us in looking at the text, we understand what Samson's talking about. He's talking about the lion. He kills this lion out of the eater, the lion that normally eats other things and people and came something to eat, the honey. Out of the strong, again the lion came something sweet, the honey. And these guys couldn't figure it out. So as the fourth day, the rest of these Philistines, they come to his wife and they try to entice her, they try to prod her, but to say, you need to convince Samson to give you the answer to this riddle. But if you don't, we're going to burn you and your family. We're going to light you guys up. Well, that's motivating. So in the week that they're supposed to be celebrating their wedding, Samson's wife is being threatened, her family's being threatened. What do you do? You start prodding your husband. Hey, honey, what was, what was that riddle you, you told him? In verse 16 it says, And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. Samson's like, Girl, I haven't even told my mom and dad what it is. Why does this matter? I'm just making a little friendly wager between some guys. Big deal. But she pulls this trump card and starts to question his love for her. Okay, we can go back to vows. Now, whether it's in our, 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 our marriage vows and our, and our relationship that way or with other people in general, that we can twist and manipulate and turn those thoughts and emotions on other people to say, honey, if you really loved me, you'd let me go fishing all weekend and never see you again. <laughs> or, honey, if you loved me, if you really loved me, you must hate me because you're not letting me buy this new piece of jewelry. Do we do that? Do we stick that fork of love and, man, you must not love me as much as I thought you did. Otherwise, you would tell me this riddle. And for this wedding week, this whole time that they're supposed to be celebrating their engagement, their marriage, she is turning this fork. She wept over him. The seven days her feast lasted and on the seventh day he told her because she pressed him hard. So they got the riddle. Came down to the wire. Samson thought, man, I've, I've got this thing beat. I'm going to get myself some new clothes, look fresh. His wife turns on him and shares the riddle. And now he's got a debt to pay to his bookies. He's got to come up with 30 pairs of clothing from somewhere. Samson's frustrated. The end of verse 18, he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Now, men, whether you're married or not, or if you get married someday, can I give you some advice? I know this is probably an analogy, but do not refer to your wife as a heifer. Bad idea. It doesn't matter if these Philistines are going to kill his wife or not. She's going to kill him first. But I think we can understand what he means. If you had not threatened my family, you would not have gotten my riddle. Because it makes no sense. But they did. 
and now he's got a debt. So what does he do? Well, he does like, like any good man or, or maybe like any mafia mob boss would do. Verse 19, he says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him again, and he went down to Ashkelon, another Philistine community, and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. So of course, that's what you do. You've got a debt to pay. Let's go kill people to pay off my debt. That sounds like a lovely plan. Again, if you're a mob boss, this sounds like a bad family deal. And he kills these guys. But again, we notice something specific. It said the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and then he did this mighty feat and took down 30 guys. Again, that sounds terrible. But keep in mind, Samson was born for this. He was, this was his purpose to take down the Philistines, to humble them, to save his people from the Philistines. So he kills these 30 guys. You know, I, I don't know what Samson may have looked like for sure, but this could be a, a possible image. Here's a big dude. I came to eat honey and kill Philistines, and I'm all out of honey. Let's go. That he could have been this incredible Samson, just this big brute of a guy. But again, we see that the strength is supernatural. That regardless of his physical physique, however much he could have benched or squatted, he has a supernatural strength about him. So he takes out these guys and he pays his, his debt, this bad bet. And he goes home thinking, okay, I'm going to spend some quality time with my wife. I'm bringing home a goat. We're going to have a bit of a meal together. We're going to celebrate. I'm going to you know, enjoy that honeymoon time. He comes out to find out that in verse 20, his wife had been given to his best man. Ouch. His wife was given to his best friend. Maybe in our context, you know, depending on your wedding, my best man was my brother. That'd be awkward. <laughs> Dude, why are you sleeping with my wife? Well, you see, while you were gone, some stuff happened and, you know, her, her dad kind of gave her to me. So now he's super ticked. Father-in-law tries convincing him, well, hey, you know, she's got a younger sister. Isn't she just as pretty? Why don't you go, go have her as your wife? So Samson's all sorts of frustrated. And he comes up with this ridiculous plan to get some vengeance on the Philistines. So somehow in, in the feat of strength and his brute quickness or speed, I don't know, he catches 300 foxes. That takes some doing. He comes up with a plan of foxes fire in a firefight. It's like, I'm going to mess up the Philistines. I'm going to hit them where it hurts. I'm going to take down their crops. So he catches all these foxes and grabs them by the tails and he starts tying them together and makes pairs of foxes. And he takes torches and he puts them in between the tails. Kind of makes a little nice loop knot. Pops the torch in between their tails. Brings them into the Philistine community and sets these fire foxes out into their grains, out into their vineyards, and they just light the place up. All their produce, it's just, it, we just finished harvest time. Can you imagine all our corn, all our beans, all our crops that, that we're going to make money on, and not to mention that are going to feed our local community? That would mess up your town in a big way. So the Philistines are now super frustrated. Who did this? It was Samson, the son-in-law, the son that Timnite guy. Well, bring his, bring his family here. So they grab Samson's wife and her father-in-law, their family, and they, they burn them anyway. So it's all come back full circle. The threat that once was upon his wife's head happened anyway. And so Samson went and he encamped somewhere in Judah, kind of between the cleft of this rock, kind of took some refuge for a while. The Philistines try chasing him down, find out where he is. They're kind of messing with the people of the village. Bring us Samson. We want Samson. We know he's here. And so the, the, Judah, the Judah guys, they go down, they get Samson. 3,000 men go to get Samson. Hey man, why'd you bring all this trouble upon us? This isn't going to help us at all. You need to get out of here. We've come to get you out of here. We've come to, to bind you up and hand you over to the Philistines. So there's some conversation that happens and they reach an agreement. You know, Samson says, well, so long as you guys don't hurt me yourselves... Go ahead and turn me over to the Philistines. So that's, that's the plan. So they bind Samson up with a couple ropes. We just saw him take out 30 guys. We just saw him rip a lion in half. This should be interesting. He's just got a couple ropes on his hands. 
Let's see what happens. So he's bound to bring him to the Philistines. Verse 14, chapter 15. It says, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. They're frustrated. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. He put out his hand, took it, and with it he struck 1,000 men. Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I struck down a thousand men. Another translation reads, With the jawbone of a donkey, I made donkeys out of them. We can kind of fill in the blanks. There's some other terms that we use to call donkeys. I've made donkeys out of those guys. I showed them what's up. They don't mess with me. But there could be another problem here. Now, it says fresh jawbone of a donkey. It doesn't say this thing's been old and petrified. It's been laying in the ground for a while. It's clean of flesh. It says it's fresh. So again, in Samson's Nazarite vow, in picking up the jawbone of this donkey, was it still attached to the donkey? Had the donkey been there for more than a few days and it's decomposing enough, he just rips this thing off? It's entirely possible, church, that Samson once again breaks his Nazarite vow while also breaking down a thousand men. He takes on a fairly sizable army all by himself. I, I don't know anybody that could play one on 12 football, let alone one on a thousand in battle, let alone with the jawbone of a donkey. This is crazy. So he takes these guys out. He flees for a bit, finds himself in a spot where, man, he's really thirsty. He's on the verge of dehydration. God, would you really let me have this victory and then let me die of thirst? So they get some water for Samson. God splits open a place. He gets water. Goes off to another community. Chapter 16 starts. He sees a prostitute. Hey, let's have a victory lap. I just accomplished some great things. Hooks up with a prostitute. In the meantime, they got guys waiting to kill him again at the town's gate. Goes down to the gate at midnight, pulls this gate open, just walks off with it and throws it on top of the hill. And then he meets Delilah. Oh man, what a vixen. Chapter 16, verse 4. After he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Samson's obviously got some lady problems. Not in the sense that they're a problem for him, and they are, and that's not all ladies. This isn't a, a sexist story, women. It's okay. Please don't burn torches and pillage me after we're done with her today. But he's obviously got a problem with the girls. And we see a similar situation happen to Samson that happened to him earlier with his first wife. That the Philistines catch wind of this. Hey, Delilah, you're one of us. You need to seduce your man. He loves you. You can make him do whatever you want. You need to seduce your man and get him to tell you his secret. Where does his strength lie? So they bribe her. Hey, we're going to give you 1,100 pieces of silver if you can tell us the secret. Challenge accepted. So she asked Samson, hey, where's, where's your strength lie, honey? You're, you're just so amazing. You're just so buff and tough. I'd like to know what your secret is. You take a, a specific pre-workout or protein or and what is it that makes you so strong? It's like, well, you see, if you bind me with seven new bowstrings, like that of a bow and arrow, they didn't have compound bows back then, seven bowstrings, if you bind me with seven new bowstrings, then I'll become like any other man. So Delilah takes her seven bowstrings, and at night while he's sleeping, she ties him up. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he wakes up, boom, shakalaka. He breaks these, breaks these strings. Nothing. He takes on the Philistines. Well, obviously he lied to Delilah. That can't make her very happy. So she asked him again, Samson, come on. Where's your strength at? Tell me, tell me how you can become like any other man. So he says, well, if you, if you use new ropes, he feeds her another lie. This is a game now. I think Samson just likes getting tied up. Use new ropes, honey, and then I'll become like any other man. So she ties him up again, new ropes while he's sleeping. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Arise! And he does, and psh, boom shakalaka. Breaks these ropes again. Now again, guys, I mean, if you've got a girl who's tying you up, she ties you up once, 
Shame on her. You let her tie you up twice, shame on you. But a third time, seriously, Samson? This, again, this is just a game. He's just toying with her. This is fun. So he says, well, honey, I'll quit mocking you. Here's, here's how this works. If you take my seven locks, my seven big locks of hair, which is interesting, and I don't know, again, depending on Samson's ethnicity, you know, maybe he had some of that nappier hair being in the Middle East. Maybe he kind of had some dreads. He's grown his hair out forever. He's got seven big dreadlocks, or maybe they're all braided up. I mean, we saw Tangled, didn't we? How did she have to manage all that hair? That's a long time to grow your hair. So he says, if you take my seven locks of hair, however that looked, and you weave them into the weaver's web, and you pin it, then I'll become like any other man. Well, that's not true. Philistines are upon you, Samson. Get them. Wakes up, pops the web, pops the pin, takes on the Philistines. Delilah is sick of this. So she does exactly what the first wife did. She starts to question his love for her. Chapter 16, verse 15. And she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. I don't know many dudes either that could probably handle that kind of pressure. That the woman you love, the woman that you want to maybe marry, to be your bride, starts to prod you like that. And if you love me, Samson, you must hate me. If you really loved me, you'd tell me your secret. But day after day, she continued to question him and his love for her. And it broke him, as it would most men. I don't care how strong you are. Emotionally, that's a lot to handle. So Samson tells her, verse 17, He told her all his heart, said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the secret's out. Delilah broke him. So somehow that night, Delilah gets him to fall asleep in her lap. He's on his knees, he's sleeping, cuddled up in her lap, taking a nap. Delilah has another person come in and start to clip, 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 cutting off these big seven locks of his hair. And like usual, verse 20, she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground a mill in the prison. Samson's broken. Not just mentally, emotionally, physically. His strength, it's gone. He's defiled himself with unclean honey. He's possibly defiled himself with strong drink. And he's let his hair go. Three strikes and Samson's out. It says the Lord left him. He's weak. He's caught. He's blind. His eyes were gone. I think for us, it's not so much that God leaves us but that like the rest of the Israelites, we often will leave and turn our back on God. For whatever it might be, even when we know the truth, we turn our back on Him. Because as we've seen in Judges, time and time again, God continues to pursue His children, to save them, to redeem them, to bring them back to Him, to give them second and third and fourth and more chances. But they continue to do evil in the sight of the Lord. They continue to do what's right in their own eyes and practice their own moral relativism, and mess up. But in this case, Samson had a special vow, and he broke it, and the Lord left him. But verse 22 says something interesting. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. So his strength might be coming back. Samson's in chains. He's locked up. The Philistines are having a big party. There's 3,000 people at this house. 
All the lords of the Philistines, maybe their rulers, their military leaders are there. They're having a merry time, putting a few back. And in their merry spirits, they say, hey, here's a good idea. Let's have some entertainment. Go get that blind guy, Samson. Bring him back out to us. Let him entertain us like a monkey. Let's, maybe he'll dance, maybe whatever he'll do. Bring him out to us. Samson comes out. They bring him out, and he has one last stand with the Philistines. Chapter 16, verse 28. It says, Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested. And he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die here. Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength in the house fell upon the lords and upon the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. You know, Samson didn't exactly make all the right decisions. Samson was set apart for greatness at birth. That he would be this great Nazarite. He'd be this great warrior, this man after God. He would deliver his people from the Philistines and he screwed up time and again. That even... From birth, when you're set aside, you can still mess it up. And that goes for us today. Regardless of your bloodline, regardless of your last name, it doesn't matter. We can still screw it up. But in the end, Samson finally got it. And Samson was all in, and he knew what he needed to do. He knew what it took to finally bring justice to his people. And in an object of repentance, he cries out to God, God, one last time, let's do this. Give me the strength. And he brings the house down, quite literally, and taking himself out in the process. You know, again, this story sounds awfully similar to another one that we celebrate in another month. That through this young woman, God brings a deliverer. God brings a young man who's going to rise up to rescue his people and deliver them and make them free. That just like Mary... God chose this young teenage woman to perform a miracle through. To say, I'm going to bring a young man into your womb and he's going to rise up one day to be king of the Jews, king of the world, and he's going to save you and he's going to redeem his people so that we might have communion and relationship again. And in a very similar stance, as Samson brings down the house, Jesus is on a cross, arms spread wide, to die at just the right time for you and me. That like Samson, Jesus too was all in. Church, like Samson, like Jesus, will you be all in today? We have an opportunity to celebrate a baptism. And as you read through the scriptures, when people came to faith in Christ and made Him Lord and Savior, almost immediately it says that them and their family were baptized. That they take this symbolic death being baptized put under the water, to be buried with Christ, to rise to new life again in Him. But as Corinthians talks about, that those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But as Peter said at Pentecost, in the book of Acts chapter 2, he must have said something good, because they wanted to know how to respond. What do we need to do? They were cut to the heart. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Church, from personal experience, I know that between the point of accepting Christ at the age of 13 and knowing that God loved me and I I, I wanted that relationship and I wanted Jesus, and maybe mostly because I didn't want to go to hell, but I accepted Christ. To the point of at 22 years old, while I'm sitting in Greek class at Bible college and we're studying this term baptism to say that, you know, you need to repent To be baptized, you need to believe and be baptized. And I know I was sprinkled in the Catholic Church as a kid and nothing against that, but man, that that wasn't this. That wasn't what I'm reading about. That I felt like I needed to make this decision for myself. And while I'm driving down the road, I don't know where I was going to see my mom at work or something, it just hit me like a truck. What do I want to do for my 22nd birthday? God said, Josh, how about you be born again? How about you take the plunge for me? How about you go under the water and fully surrender to me, because you haven't. That even while at Bible college, I was holding on to some of the similar sins that Samson struggled with. Some of these lady issues. 
And I didn't want God to be messing with that. But I knew in my heart I needed to let that go. That not just to have Jesus as a Savior, but to have Jesus as my Lord and really live for Him. So that's what I did. And I just, just wept in my car when this hit me. It's like, okay, God, here it is. And I talked to some of my professors. I talked to a local pastor. And that night on my 22nd birthday, I was baptized into Christ. And when it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, I tell you what, when temptation came, and it did, and it still does, it is so much easier to say no to that honey because of the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Church, we're either in one of two camps this morning. Either you have yet to make that decision. You have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And maybe you have and you haven't taken this step of obedience. And we could argue, is it necessary to be baptized in order to be saved? Isn't that a work? I don't know. But God's Word says we need to do it, every one of you. That Jesus did it Himself. That He was baptized. God's Son felt the need to model that for us to say, man, if it's okay, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's okay for me. And if we haven't made that decision yet, the water is nice and warm. It's a, it's a balmy 90 degrees. Those heaters worked great. And your clothes will dry. So if you didn't come here prepared to do this, that's all right. If you're prepared now to be all in, be all in. But maybe you're in the other camp. Maybe you've already made this decision. Maybe you've already accepted Christ. You've been baptized. You've been a Christian for a while. You've grown up in the church. God's Word also still gives us this mission. Now Jesus, before He went back to the Father, said, all power and authority is given to me. And Matthew, giving us this great commission, he says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So if we're in that camp, how are we doing at making disciples? Are we all in in this mission? Are we all in ourselves in observing what Jesus has commanded us? Or are we, like Israel, still not getting it? And we continue to turn back to our old ways. What camp are you in this morning? Again, Samson eventually got it, and he was all in. Unfortunately for the people of Israel, they, they never really got it. And as the book of Judges closes in chapter 21, verse 25, it says, In those days... There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But even to the end of Judges, time and time again, God sends a judge to save his people, and never clicked. And they continued to practice their own rights and wrongs, and turned away from God. We either need to turn to God this morning, accepting him as Lord and Savior, living for him, or we need to continue to come back, to ask for forgiveness, to repent. And start living for God. Church, are you all in? Will we be like Samson? Will we follow Christ to the end? God, we thank you for this time to get into your word. Thank you for an opportunity to study this book of Judges in these last month. We pray that you continue to guide us as we draw closer to you. And God, I pray that if, man, if those this morning that still need to make this decision to be baptized into you, I pray that you would encourage them. I pray you continue to move in them. Show us that this is a step that we need to take. Father, I pray for those that have already made this decision. God, still help us to be all in, that we ourselves would be obedient servants to you, following what you've told us to do. God, there's a lot we can learn from Samson and the people of Israel. Help us to continue to follow you and do what's right, not in our eyes, but in yours. So God, we pray that you continue to bless this time as we come to a time of communion to remember what you just did on the cross for us. To remember your death, God, that this was for us. That your body was broken, your blood was shed. That we might have fellowship with you. So God, open our hearts, move in us, and show us what we need to do. We lift these things up to you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, Amen.